this is Julie Lubinsky. I am the Associate Director for the Christopher and Dana Reed Foundation, and I'd like to welcome you all to this live chat with Nurse Linda. Today's topic is upper extremity treatments. Linda Schultz is a leader and provider of rehabilitation nursing for over 30 years and a friend of the Christopher and Dana Reed Foundation for close to two decades. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Linda. Hey, Linda. Hi, Julie, and thank you for that introduction. Welcome everyone. As you know, the, the wind is blowing and it has turned cold. So whenever the temperature changes, I always like to mention, be sure and dress for the weather. Um, there are very few people, but there are some people out there that um, tell me, well, I can leave my uh, shoes off and I don't need any kind of uh, coat or extra sweater because I don't feel it anyway. And I always think, yes, but your body does. So for those few people that do that, if we can just reach one or two of those people and say, please dress according to the weather because you know getting frostbite is no fun. It's very dangerous. You might have to have surgery. You might need an amputation. For those people who have the uh, complication of diabetes, circulation may not be as good. The amputation might be far more than just that toe. So, um, you know, and that, that can introduce a whole host of problems from spasticity to autonomic dysreflexia to just the, the challenge of having surgery. Um, there's many more people who um, have temperature regulation when, it, when they go in and out. And this is one of those days here where I am where you could just run out to the car and it's cool, but you know, you'll get to the car and you'll get warmed up soon enough. But remember to dress, dress for the weather because some people have that uh, autonomic issue where their body just doesn't adjust to too hot or too cold. And it takes a long time to get that uh, temperature back up. And so people feel, they feel achy, they feel awful, they get crabby. Um, and sometimes they just can't get their temperature regulated until they go to sleep and wake up again. So it kind of like pulls some time out of your day for that. So just uh, dress carefully. We also want to, you know, keep ourselves healthy. So be sure and wear those masks and do the hand washing, stay socially distant and all that sort of thing. So, um, but today we're going to talk about uh, the upper extremity, um, which is a problem for a lot of people regardless if you have paralysis or if you don't. So this kind of is a coverall for lots of different things. Um, so first of all, I wanted to talk a little bit about overuse of the arm. And I see that we have some questions coming up about arthritis. So I wanted to really, uh, I had this on my list anyway, so it kind of dovetails all together, which is kind of a nice um, thing when, when you know you've hit the right questions to answer. So sometimes people, you know, because the joints in the arms, the arms aren't made to uh, constantly lift body weight like the legs are. The legs are made to hold and support your body weight, but the arms aren't so much. The joints are smaller, the arms are smaller, the muscles are smaller. So um, on occasion, um, people get some issues with their shoulders, with their elbows, with their wrists, especially if you're transferring and you know, bending your hand and putting all your body weight through that wrist. So you want to be very cautious with what you're doing and how you're caring for yourself. Give yourself a little break um, now and again. So people who transfer, you want to be very careful of that pressure you're putting on your wrist. Um, if you use crutches, it's the same kind of thing of putting all that pressure through your wrist, through your elbows, through your shoulders. And if you're um, using a manual chair and pushing yourself, a lot of times I'll try to position myself. A lot of times people will want to give the really get the wheelchair going, so they reach way back, which your arm does go way back comfortably. That's not a problem. But when you do this so repetitively, you can really feel it pulling in the shoulder. Just if I keep pulling too far back, so you want to be um, when you push or propel your wheelchair. You want to start with your arm straight down so you don't have that backward motion. Now, a lot of people think, oh, no, I've got to get way back there and give myself a good push. But the reality is you can start with your arm hanging straight down and then just push forward. 
It's a lot less on the shoulder and it's a lot less on the arms. There's some other things you can do to help your shoulders and your arms. So um, if you do your exercises to strengthen yourself, make sure that you've got good range of motion, that's certainly going to help. Using transfer equipment, if you have some, now that doesn't mean that you can't, maybe you go out of your home and you wanna do a transfer uh, to in and out of the car or something. Transfer equipment in your home just um, helps you reduce the number of transfers that you're doing every day. So that can be a helpful kind of thing. There's all kinds of new kinds of things. You know, we used to think transfers had to be done with a Hoyer lift and, and they still can be. And some people do that and that's great. Um, some people transfer with a Hoyer lift independently. It's possible. Um, and then there are also um, other kinds of like standing devices. And there's even a little thing. It looks like kind of like a lazy Susan. If you have some trunk support, or if you have somebody who can help you, um, you can pivot on this little lazy Susan thing to help move your body. That reduces some of the workload on your body. Um, and also don't forget the old, the old uh, favorite, the sliding board. So that's another good thing as well that will help you move along. You can get power assist to your wheelchair. That's something that you can be looking into, um, hopefully before there's any damage to your arms or shoulders, but definitely if you have any arms or shoulders, that's a good um, reason why insurance might pay or payer might pay for that power assist. Um, now power assist, is a great thing. It helps you uh, move your chair. You can just do a little tiny push to your wheels and shoo, you're down the street four blocks. It is kind of a heavy device. So if you're having to lift your chair in and out of the trunk of your car, that can be an issue too. So, you know, you want to think about all the little things that go along with that, which actually are big things. Like, do you need a, a lift on the top of your car that can just pick that chair and put it up in the back of the car? all those kinds of things. Something very simple, if you have a reacher, instead of trying to reach way high up there to get something and overstretching your arm and trying to get something from high, you know, see if you can get one of those reachers. They sell them in uh, the drug stores and the big box stores. They're a big Christmas item. A lot of people buy them that have no kind of uh, physical problem at all, but they just buy them to get something off the top shelf. They've greatly improved them. If you haven't seen the newer models, there'll be a lot out for Christmas and there'll be some good prices on them. Um, uh, Last year, I got some at the Costco or Sam's Club, one of those kind of things, which was a package of two, of course. Um, but I got it for my mom, and she just likes it because she has one in her kitchen and one in the bedroom. So wherever she goes, she has what she needs. So that's kind of a handy thing. Um, uh, think about ergonomics. If you're sitting at your desk, sitting in your chair, get a good look at yourself sitting in your chair from the front, from the side. Somebody can take a picture of you from the back to make sure that your body is wrecked, that you're not slouching, that you're not hanging over too much to one side. Sometimes people who have a stroke have some neglect on one side of their body or the other. So since they're not maybe seeing or feeling uh, one side of their body, they'll tend to normalize themselves thinking they're in the middle because you know this part is not uh, available to their brain. So they might go to one side or another. So look at the ergonomics, look at your equipment, equipment, you know, I know we've, um, I shouldn't say fight, fight is the word, but um, we disagree on this all the time with payers that people, you know, equipment, they use it all day long. And sometimes people's equipment wear out before the payer is ready to purchase more equipment. But look at your equipment to see if it's still working for you. Make sure it's supporting you, that you're not sitting with one hip higher than the other to make sure your feet rests are in alignment, all that kind of thing. All those little details, sometimes they can be fixed and repaired and it can really make a difference in your body. Um, also, the number one thing I should have said in the beginning, if somebody is helping you transfer, be sure that they're not pulling you by your arm, because again, your arm is not gonna be able to take the whole body weight. Um, so uh, some other things for people who have had something like stroke 
or who have tetraplegia, or for some reason their arms are not functioning, some of the spinal cord uh, syndromes affect arms but not the legs. So that arm is very heavy. Your legs and your arms are very, very heavy. Um, but your arm can be very heavy, and when it's just hanging at your side, then um, what happens is it can get loosen from the shoulder and it's called subluxation. And this is a real thing and it happens to people all the time. So sometimes uh, people who um, ha have, a, have a stroke or even people who have tetraplegia, they'll get a shoulder harness that kind of supports, it wraps around the upper arm, then it wraps across the chest and across the back and it, it, it really uh, attaches a clasp attaches over here so that your arm is the weight of your arm. If you don't have good shoulder support, it does not hang down so far that the shoulder separates up here at the joint. And you can very gently feel at the top of your shoulders and where the um, where that ball and socket joint is, um, right in right in about here, right where the line of your shirt would be if you had one. My line of my shirt is way down here because you know it's fashionable. But if you have a, a dress shirt on, it's right about the line where that line of the shirt is, and you can feel very gently because you don't want to separate anything more than it is. But you can feel if there's a little divot in there. And then we measure that subluxation or the amount that the ball has fallen out of the socket of the joint here. We measure it by finger widths, one finger width, two finger widths. And you can feel that little valley in there. So you know if you've got a separation up there, that's kind of a quick and easy way to do it. Sometimes people have, yes, three finger widths or four finger widths of separation up here. So that can get to be a serious, serious problem. Um, so how do you do that? You can wear that harness. Um, sometimes people will have a tray on their uh, armrest so that they can lay their arm out. Um, funny story, uh, <laughs> down by where I work, there was a lady um, that lived in an apartment down there and she had um, one of those docks and a wiener dog. And I would always see her every day and her arm would be just, you know, across her waist and it was really drooping down. You could see it drooping down and she had a tray, but that's where her dachshund rode in her wheelchair. So it was just perfect size for this little dachshund dog. Unfortunately, she had lots of arm trouble because she preferred the dachshund to ride with her than to use that piece of equipment. So use your equipment as it is intended. Um, so let's see what else. Um, sometimes people, when they're uh, extending their arm back too far, they might have rotator cuff uh, issues with their muscles and they might need surgery for that. Um, then there's also the tunnel syndrome. So we hear about those overuse syndromes with the carpal tunnel. Everybody knows that's a nerve entrapment with the nerves that go right through here. And you can tell if you have one of these because you'll have numbness, tingling, maybe electricity shooting through your hands. It might feel burning. They might be, your fingers might be cold or numb. And so those are all symptoms of uh, carpal tunnel syndrome. And the ulnar, the ulnar and the radial nerve both go through here. There's a little tunnel and it's kind of got some um, fibrous tissue that, that those nerves go through there, but that tunnel can get smaller uh, through overuse or um, sometimes through swelling. So a lot of times women who are pregnant will have issues with one of their tunnels uh, because there's a lot of swelling and a lot of extra fluid in pregnancy. And so they might have carpal tunnel syndrome, but after they deliver the baby, that swelling goes away and it goes away. So that's kind of nice for them. Um, but it happens a lot with people who are pregnant. It also happens a lot with individuals who have diabetes. So if you have that as a secondary complication of paralysis, it's important to know. If you have the uh, one of those nerves trapped in here, if it's the ulnar nerve, these first two fingers and this half of the middle finger will have the the symptoms, the um, numbness, tingling, and all those things. If it's, uh, or ex excuse me, if it's the radial nerve, if it's the ulnar nerve, it'll be the pinky, uh, the ring finger, and the half facing those other two fingers that will have those issues. 
The other place where you can get uh, entrapment is here in the elbow. That's called the cubital tunnel. And then you can also get an entrapment up here in the shoulder. You can also get it at the knee at, at the um, piriformis, which is uh, actually in the rear end, um, straight through um, the cheek there, and uh, also down by the ankle. So there are all kinds of uh, tunnels in the body where nerves are going through these areas by joints where they need a little more protection. So you have that extra fibrous tissue there to protect those nerves that are running pretty close to the skin. So there are releases that can be done for that. Sometimes if you catch it early, if you start feeling those sensations and you catch it early enough, you can get a splint to wear just at night because in the daytime, you're gonna be protecting your hand. You don't wanna wear the splint 24 seven. I see a lot of people who do that because they have carpal tunnel. That's really kind of making it a little bit worse because you need to have that range of motion. When you're awake, you're not gonna be flipping your hand around and doing those extreme pulling on that nerve. But when you're asleep at night, you can flip your arms around. So just wear the braces mostly at night, but you know, do whatever your health professional tells you to do about that then they can release that surgically if you, need to, if you need to have that kind of thing. Now, a lot of people have written in about strengthening and what the, can they do. So if you have that shoulder subluxation, if you have muscle weakness, what kinds of things can you do? How can you get more power, especially in your upper extremities, but really through your legs as well. And if you have an injury in the cervical or the thoracic spine, or sometimes with stroke or other diseases like multiple sclerosis, Guillain-Barre, there's a whole variety of uh, diagnosis that affects spinal cord and or brain. So you can do this electrical stimulation. So um, there's a TENS, which is a real low electrical stimulation that just gives a little vibration. It's actually, if you've ever had a TENS, it's a very pleasant. So they'll put that over a nerve or over a muscle and that electricity will go through there, but it feels like a little pleasant little vibration. So um, it helps really with pain. And I know I had some, um, some uh, back pain at one time and I went to the physical therapist and had some tens and I will say it was delightful. I loved it. And the carryover lasts a really long time. So it was just wonderful. Um, it's, it's like a first level treatment. And then there's uh, electrical muscle stimulation, which can be used uh, for stimulating those muscles to get them stronger, strengthening. Uh, there's a uh, next kind of level is inferential current, which can help reduce tone. So if you uh, can fatigue your muscles and the nerves that are affected by tone or spasticity, then that kind of reduces the amount of spasticity that you have. The uh, inferential current also helps with edema reduction, which is nice. They also have... Um, some electrical stimulation that can help with wound healing. So much like the uh, vacuum for uh, wound drainage, they will have some that they can place an electrode where the wound is and that stimulates the blood flow. And so that helps with uh, wound healing, kind of a nice thing. Neuromuscular stimulation is a little bit higher up the uh, chain of command here. Um, that helps with strength and increasing muscles, atrophy, muscle spasms. And then there's FES, which is that functional electrical stimulation. So you see people that are doing bicycles. The FES is really something that's done for functional movement. So if you can get um, some FES equipment, sometimes people will use it for their hands or their arms. Um, to, to do repetitive movements, but it's really helpful if you think about that movement while you're doing it. So you might not feel it, you might not be able to make that brain connection, you know, move my arm, I want to I wanna exercise and move my arm, but, but the electrical current will do that. So if you think, if you have the electrical current, it's sending a message up to the area where the spinal cord injury is, you're thinking about it, you're sending your brain message and hopefully you've made some connection back in there at some point in time. There's also spinal cord stimulators which are implanted 
which of course is um, really under study right now with a lot going on. And so I expect, unless of course, um, you know, it gets delayed by the COVID because, you know, everything has been, but I expect we'll be seeing more and more results from that uh, sooner rather than later. And there are some, um, several different organizations that are coming out with spinal cord stimulators um, for market. So there'll be market around the United States. So it'll be easier to find somewhere you won't have to travel to a certain facility. Now, it's not the kind of thing where you can just drop it in and whoa, you can suddenly move your arms. But you do need to have some therapy to learn how to retrain, to strengthen your muscles first, have the stimulator implanted, and then learn how to retrain uh, your nerves and muscles to work again. So it is a huge process and huge undertaking. But it seems like the benefits are going to be pretty uh, wild. So now a lot of people say to me, Linda, quit talking about that. We can't get that. We don't even want to hear about it. I get that comment sometimes. And I think, well, it's kind of good to know that what's out there. But yes, I don't mean to be dangling in front of you. But more and more payers are paying for these. Also, please know that in most policies, be it Medicaid, Medicare, private insurance, there typically is, in most payers' policies, two weeks per year for therapy for mobility training. Now, a lot of people think, well, I'm not close to walking, so that really doesn't apply to me. Ah, oh, but it does, because mobility training can be using your arm. Mobility training can be learning to use some of these FES. And if you get a positive response with that, that gives you information that you can arm and go to your payer and say, look, I did this two weeks. It was very successful. Will you fund um, some electrical stimulation for me? More than likely, they will say no, because the first round in insurance is you you or your health professional on your behalf ask for a therapy or a piece of equipment. It goes, I don't even know if a person does this or if it goes to the computer and they look it up and they say, is this covered in your policy? No, it is not. So they send you a letter that says, no, it's not. You have to appeal and appeal and you might have to appeal. There's a gentleman I, here in my hometown. He had an uh, item about himself on the news and he had gotten an FES bike for which it took him six years to get the spike. Now that's a terrifically long time, but he kept going with it and going with it and kept appealing and working with his healthcare professional that was really outstanding to keep up with this as well. But they kept going with it and he just wanted to, he just wanted people to know it can be done. And I just thought, oh, I wish everybody could have seen that news item because it was so motivating for getting those kinds of things um, that people really need. So there is funding available for these kinds of things. It can be through your payer with a lot of effort. Um, sometimes you can talk to different organizations uh, like community organizations, um, religious organizations. If you keep looking around in your community, sometimes you can piece together a funding package for some of this for you by yourself. I also want to say there's an interesting study that came out um, through the University of Washington in Seattle. They have a big spinal cord injury center there. And FES is usually done, the functional electrical stimulation is usually done by putting electrodes on certain muscle groups, like in the arm. I'm showing you, but you can't see it down here. So hold it up here. They'll put electrodes on certain to get you to do different functions with your arms or your legs or whatever. Well, somebody got the idea out there, um, a physician, a physiatrist out there and said, what if we put it right over the spinal cord over the back of the neck? And let's try this and, and see what happens. And they did. And they thought, well, okay, it's going to take so long for people to learn how to use this. And they'll have to have so many therapy sessions. And then, you know, it will be this whole big process. They were shocked to find out people got, people got it within one or two sessions. So their protocol is available on, on the web. They're freely giving out their protocol. So if you're interested in trying something like that, it's through um, a little portable uh, elect uh, electrical stimulator. It's not a big piece of equipment. It's not a really uh, that expensive piece of equipment. 
And by that, I mean, it would be under a couple thousand dollars, which sounds like, well, that's expensive, but it's not like some of this equipment that's like close to $100,000. So it's a very small piece of equipment that can really make somebody who has upper extremity function needs, can really help them be functional. And also they're finding that when they take off the device, the carryover stays for a while. And the more you use the device, the more the carryover seems to stay. So even when you don't have the device on, you're still able to do some of those functions that the device uh, created for you. So it's at um, University of Washington in Seattle, and you look up functional electrical stimulation for the arms, and there's the protocol. It, it, it's um, right out there. So that's good. Um, some of the other things people do and have done, one is to create a tenodesis in their hands. So if you are like at the C6 level and you have arm function, but not really so much hand and finger function, um, there, there are some exercises that can be done so that when you move your wrist up, your fingers will close. Sometimes they do a tendon transfer in the thumb or maybe some of the fingers to get a tighter seal. And when you put your wrist down, the fingers automatically open to release whatever it is. So you can grab things. People can feed themselves. So it, it provides a lot of function. Some people love the independence of the function that it gets. And some people don't like it because it makes their hand look different than how it looked before. So, you know, these things are entirely up to you. People have opinions about, you know, what they want to do and what they don't want to do. And that's fine. Um, constraint induced therapy is another therapy that's done where if you have some movement, say in one arm that's strong and maybe some weak movement in the other arm, they will um, constrain the, the arm with a lot more function so that you're forced to build the muscles in the other arm. So that's a therapy that might be beneficial for some people. Um, people with amputations or sometimes people not with amputation, but again, uh, if you have movement in one arm that's pretty strong, they will use a mirror so that your brain is actually tricked into seeing the arm that's moving so it looks like both of your arms are moving and that kind of helps remap the brain a bit. And then, of course, there's all this FES that's going on. So there's a lot of things that are available for upper extremity, but you might have to seek them out uh, pretty diligently to find uh, what you want to use there. So let's get to some of these questions. And I said, as I said, there were some questions about um, arthritis. And so here's a person who's 27 years as a quadriplegic or tetraplegic, they're kind of interchangeable. Um, most people call themselves quadriplegic and health and um, spinal cord injury. Um, we call it tetraplegic now because it's a more correct term, but we all know what we're talking about here. So what can I do about arthritis? And the next person has written in about arthritis as well. They're having some uh, clicking when they're using things. So of course, the thing you want to do about arthritis is to avoid arthritis. Some people without spinal cord injury or with spinal cord injury get arthritis, you know, no matter what they do. Uh, but it's from, it's from really overusing those joints and it's an inflammatory process. And so um, it's for some people, it's going to be pretty hard to avoid, especially if you look in your family tree and you find oh, a lot of arthritis, you know, you're going to be pretty susceptible to that. So um, in thinking about that, uh, what can you do? So one thing is to not to try to overuse uh, your joints. So, and that doesn't mean that, well, I'm here now with a little bit of arthritis, so it's too late for me. No, see if you can get some, you know, develop some of these techniques, not pulling back so far, not straining to reach things. Um, see if you can be, you know, more kind to your joints. Now, arthritis responds very well to gentle exercise. If you do really hard exercise, and you know, we all hear this, um, you know, no pain, no gain. Well, this is not for arthritis. It's really um, not the thing to, you want to do really at all. But if you're very, very gentle to your joints, it can really help loosen those joints and keep them supple. So doing a little bit of exercise uh, is good. 
there's medication for arthritis that um, you can take. They do have some side effects. And I know this one person says that they're taking some uh, Celebrex and they, they don't really like taking um, medication. So there are a lot of side effects sometimes with arthritis medications, but it can really decrease that inflammation in there. So it can really help. Um, one person's using heat and um, a menthol roll. And I thought, oh, that sounds so pleasant. A little hot pack on this cold day with a little menthol. Oh, that would just be delightful. Um, but anyway, I digress. Um, so anyway, um, the after um, medications, uh, sometimes they'll go in and they'll clean out the joint. Um, sometimes that might need to do a joint replacement to give you your mobility back. It depends on how, how serious they're this is. Now, there are some things that people are doing, um, and that's this uh, platelet uh, enriched um, uh, platelet enriched what am I, what's the other word? I think. Plasma transfer. So they, they get some um, uh, plasma uh, it might be from you, it might be from somebody else. They take out some of the fluid and they just pack it with these platelets to help get a good blood supply in the joint. Um, there's also some things that people are doing uh, in the knee with stem cells um, where they take your own stem cells out of your knee and at the joint and they grow them in the lab and then they replant them in there so you don't have that bone on bone and in the knee and it's very successful um for a lot of people it's very successful it's not always successful but it's pretty successful it's got a good success rate now there is kind of hard to find places that do that you might have to look around to find a place you want to go to a legitimate place um, that, you know, accepts insurance, not somebody who's making you pay on the side because that probably is not. So you really have to do your investigative work to find out because there's a lot of people who want to sell you stuff with stem cells and you really, they're not legitimate people, but boy, you look up stem cell treatment and phew, you're going to have a lot of places. So go to a medical center, go to, um, a physician, ask other people, um, all kinds of things, because there's been a lot of uh, racketeering really with the stem cells. So be sure and and really look at these kind of things to make sure you're going to a legitimate place. Your insurance will pay for it more than likely um, if you're going to a legitimate place as opposed to having to pay 10, 20, $50,000 for this, then it, it's probably not what you want to do. If somebody has their own formula that's different from everybody else in the world, that's probably not the place you want to go. If somebody has something that works in healthcare, everybody knows about it. It's legitimate. So be sure and be very uh, cautious about those kinds of things. Um, so, you know, avoiding it is the best thing, but sometimes it happens and you've done everything right. So don't sit around, oh, I shouldn't have done this or I shouldn't have done that. Arthritis happens. So there are lots of treatments. There are lots of things that you can do. Um, sometimes people will give just even like a, a cortisol in, injection into the joint. Now about that stem cell things, they're doing a lot of it in the knee. They're not doing so much up in the shoulders. Um, there are people that uh, will do that, but it's pretty hard to find because there's the brachial plexus is up here and there's so many nerves around in here. So it's kind of hard to get into that point. So it's probably on the horizon. So we'll know about that. Sometimes uh, the electrical stimulation can kind of help with those um, joint movements and um, kind of reduce some of that pain to get some blood flowing uh, into the particular area. Um, oh, another question about arthritis is, um, uh, do gloves help? And a lot of times the gloves do help, makes things a little bit more comfortable. Uh, splints at night with arthritis, you really want to check with your doctor to see where your progression is, how, how it's going. Uh, sometimes putting a splint on restricts the movement of that joint. So it makes it uh, more difficult stiffening. You want to keep your joints limber, really gentle range of motion exercises. I'm 
ranging my fingers right now. And you know what? No matter what, if you have sensation, if you don't, if you have arthritis, if you don't, it feels good. So, you know, it's kind of a nice thing to do, a uh, little treat for yourself. Um, so uh, check with your doctor because sometimes uh, if you restrict your movement too much, you're um, not getting that movement that's going to add up to more arthritis. So think about, yes, because, you know, especially arthritis in the hands and in the thumbs and the wrists, that does make everything a little bit more difficult. So see if you can get some of those uh, prevention types of equipment. So if you can get uh, some kind of transferring equipment. So when you're at home, you don't have to transfer. Maybe when you go out, you don't transfer at all, but at least so you don't have all that uh, weight going through your arms and those kinds of things. If you can get a power assist chair, all those things are, are very helpful. Um, it's a question about, uh, uh, and I know we've had this for uh, the last couple of sessions, but people asking about, thinning of the skin as, as we age and, and our, our skin doesn't get thinner, but the substance underneath the skin gets a little bit more sparse. So it makes people think they have a uh, thinner skin. Also, if you're taking um, anticoagulants that affects uh, the uh, blood vessels. So, you know, you'll see people that hit their hand and they have a big purple bruise on their hand or their arm because they're taking um, anticoagulants for other problems. So, uh, you know, people say, oh, my, thin's, my skin's so thin. That's really a ves uh, vessel sort of problem because they've, uh, you've got your blood thin, so you don't have a heart attack or stroke or something that you're trying, a, a blood clot that you're trying to prevent. So, um, so this person wants to know they've had no skin breakdown, but what, what can they do for the aging skin? There are a few things you can do. Um, first of all is avoid really steaming hot water. So if you're a person that loves a hot shower and oh boy, do I try to take one that's just a little bit warmer than your skin. So you don't get that, uh, temperature maladjustment but that's not so hot that, you know, your skin turns red or, you know, it, it feels good on your muscles and it helps loosen your muscles, but it also helps um, kind of uh, reduce your skin integrity when you get that really hot kind of shower. Um, the other thing is to hydrate, hydrate your body, um, drink as much fluid as you can. If you are on a bladder management system and you cannot drink a lot of fluid, then um, drink as much fluid as you can and also hydrate the skin from the outside. So using those emollient type of lotions, um, even if you don't have diabetes, uh, the, di the lotions that are developed for diabetes are particularly good for skin issues, just keeping that because they have a lot of um, mixture in there to help retain hydration in the skin because dry skin is a problem when you have diabetes. So even if you don't have it, you can still take advantage of that hydrating type of lotion. So that's all good kinds of things to do too. And also doing your pressure uh, releases. You might wanna even pick up on doing a few more releases. If you're doing your pressure releases where you press on the arms of your wheelchair and lift your body up, Again, you're using that uh, wrist, you know, to lift your body weight. So you might want to switch to doing pressure shifts where you're leaning over the side of your chair this way, leaning over, and then stay off that leaning over for a couple of minutes. Um, it's good if you can lean forward, but don't do that. In fact, don't even lean until you've done it with somebody watching you because sometimes knowing your position in space after a spinal cord injury is a challenge. So we don't want you leaning forward and tumbling forward. So practice with somebody there to spot you. Even when you go over the side, we don't want you to go, you know, we don't want you to flip your chair over to the side and get hurt. So always have somebody with you while you're learning to do that. And then once you're comfortable with it, then go ahead and do that. And if you have, um, a power chair and you can press, you know, you can go back and forth, up and down, leaning back and uh, stay back for five or 10 minutes 
which gets just shifts the weight from those bony prominences. And you really need to do this like every 10 minutes. So if you've been lucky and you know, you think, oh, I've got my pressure uh, dispersing equipment, so I don't need to do any of that. Yes, you do. There is no equipment that prevents a pressure sore or pressure injury 100%. There just, there just is, there just is none. So um, think about those kind of things and, you know, just be hyper vigilant. Check your skin. Uh, if you can't see your backside and you've got a cell phone, take a picture of your backside. You need to know what your skin looks like. Um, if you have an attendant that's checking for you, well, that's great, but check together because you need to know. Your attendant could be sick and um, you know, or for whatever reason, COVID, and not there anymore. <clears throat> Maybe you've been watching a, a change in pigmentation on your skin. So you need to know because you're always in your body. Other people around you, things happen for whatever reason. So you need to know what's going on in and around your body at all times. Um, the other thing is if you get any change in pigmentation now in uh, lightly pigmented skin, people, you'll get a red spot, maybe something that looks like a bruise. In uh, darkly pigmented uh, skin people, they'll get more like a purple spot or something called like an ashy spot, um, which means that circulation isn't happening there. Once you see that change in pigmentation, that means a pressure injury has already started because they start from within your body next to the bone and work their way out. So when you see that change in pigmentation, you already have something in there close to that bone. So you have to stay off of it. Now people will say, well, it hasn't resolved in so many hours. It hasn't resolved in a day, <clears throat> but you need to stay off of it no matter how long it takes. Because Anytime you put pressure back on that spot, you're negating all the time you've stayed off of it because you're closing those capillaries again. So you need to stay completely off of it. And the, the sooner you catch it, the easier it is, even if it takes a day or weeks to get that area resolved. And then you need to slowly add pressure. So you can't go right back to all day sitting on it the next day that it's resolved. You've got to build up your tolerance all over again. And the reason for this, why you want to catch it early is because once it's open, you have that chance for infection, but the more stages you get through, you know, there's that one through four staging of the ulcer. So, you know, you lose the top layer of skin and then you lose the tissue in, and then you're starting to see um, fat in there and bone and it gets deeper and deeper. So the deeper it is, the more it's open, it's harder to heal that. If it becomes so bad that you have to have surgery, usually sometimes they make you even sign a contract. And even after surgery, it might be three, six months, eight months that you are in bed off of that. So that's like a big chunk out of your life, just laying around in bed. And boy, I tell you, it's like people that have done this, they're just like, trust me, I will never get another one. But also once that's broken open and once that wound becomes really deep, like any other thing, like a paper cut on your skin, you're going to have a little scar there. And so scar is not elastic, like skin tissue is, look at it's elastic. Scar tissue is not elastic. So when you put pressure on something like my knuckle here, if I fold it, I've got a lot of pressure there. You can see it's white. Um, but I can pull that skin up over my knuckle pretty high over joint skin is pretty loose. Um, but if that's a scar there, then it's not elastic. And so you have more risk later on. So the minute you see a change in your skin, you've got to be hyper vigilant about this. It's just really important because it saves you a lot of trouble uh, down the road. A big question. Anything new on clinical trials? Well, I mentioned, uh, yes, everything's new in clinical trials, which is great. Lots of studies are going on. This is probably one of the times in history where there's more studies um, about spinal cord injury due to lots of 
different groups of people, but probably the granddaddy organization, the Christopher and Dana Reeve uh, Foundation, Paralysis Foundation, which really got a lot of uh, interest and a lot of people uh, interested in spinal cord injury. You know, um, before Christopher Reeve, there was studies going on in spinal cord injury and a lot of successful things um, in uh, secondary conditions of spinal cord injury. So we know a lot of things about pressure injuries. We know a lot of things about uh, diabetes, bladder and bowel, and we know all these things. But really after the Christopher Reeve put that spotlight on spinal cord injury, suddenly uh, people became more interested. So scientists started studying, people started donating to these causes. And sometimes uh, researchers like to say, well, you know, we're doing this for the science, but it takes a little bit of notoriety to get people interested. So once the money started loosening up, that more people would go into studying spinal cord injury because if you went into doing research in spinal cord injury and there was no there were no grants or no funding well you know you have to you have to earn your living you have to pay for your research you have to pay for your rent at home you have to have a salary so if nobody was paying for that kind of research then people didn't want to go into it so there's been this huge uh, shift and change because spinal cord injury research is not just for spinal cord injury, but it's nervous system injury and different groups are starting to work together. Different organizations are doing fundraising. So there's just an abundance of things going on in spinal cord injury. Um, the research in autonomic dysreflexia, the discovery that people have silent AD. If you have an injury above T6 and some above T10, um, they were doing a study totally unrelated, uh, but they were doing this study on electrical stimulation and people who were doing the functional electrical stimulation. And they were checking their blood pressure after their therapy into the night, into the next day to see it, uh, what effects they were having. It was just a part of the routine of, let's see what's happening to people who are doing this electrical stimulation. My golly, they found out that people who had no AD during the day, had no symptoms whatsoever, were having, and this was in the control group, not the people who were having the FES. FES kind of helped relieve uh, some of that, but in the control group that were not doing anything different, oh my gosh, what they found out was that they were having AD blood pressure recordings in the middle of the night while they were sleeping without any of the signs like the headache or the goosebumps or the feeling funny or the blurry eyes or the stuffy nose, they were having symptoms of this. That, well, this is interesting. They, they named it silent AD. So then they started looking around. Well, what about, you know, the common causes, the three top three for AD, but anything can trigger AD, but the top three, um, you're not coming out. Um, so they started looking at different uh, processes during catheterization, neurodynamics. Yeah, some people were having AD. So they started looking at bowel programs, the number two reason for cause of AD. And a lot of people were having AD episodes without any symptoms, but the blood pressure changes uh, during the bowel program, during wound care, those people with uh, wound care. So lots and lots of information because their treatments for AD and AD is um, a, a nervous system problem, but that blood pressure changes affects the cardiovascular system. So you want to reduce those episodes of AD for a stronger, healthier heart and cardiovascular system. So that's been a wonderful um, surprise and a big push forward. Um, there's also all this going on with the implantable stimulation and the external on the skin stimulation. There's a lot of successes going on in that. There's a lot of uh, success with going on in skin care and the way we're handling skin care. There's uh, uh, new catheters. If you look at the supplies of catheters, you know, so equipment is always um, being advanced, which is is a nice. And, um, you know, a few years ago, people were really studying um, stem cells, and that was the hubbub. And it still plays a great deal, a great part in 
uh, repair of the spinal cord and repair of neurological issues and is still being studied. So one of the big problems about uh, 15 years ago was that you could put stem cells in the spine, um, in that hole in the center of the spine, if you get an injury to your spine, the damage occurs in the center of the spinal cord. Even if it's a bump on the outside of the spine, the damage occurs in the center. Well, you've got to be able to get those stem cells in there, but the, the nerves on the outside of the spinal cord are not damaged. So when you put a needle in to try to inject those stem cells in there, that needle's going to hit one of those nerves. Well, you don't want that to happen. So they're figuring out ways um, to do that better. But also once they got the nerve in there, they couldn't, or the stem cells in there, they couldn't get them to grow outside of the little scar that goes around this hole, but they're being able to do that. And they're creating scaffolds like on a building, but a scaffold inside the spinal cord to be able to support those stem cells. So that is very much still going on. So there's just, oh, every, every turn, there's something going on. Um, now here's a question about, is there any treatments devices that can help rebuild muscles in the lower extremities? If you have that injury in the cervical or thoracic area, those are reflexive injury and you can, you can build muscle. People who have injury in their sacral area or their lumbar area have a reflexive injury for the most part. There's always an exception somewhere but those don't really respond to stimulation. However, they do. Res there is some response in the peripheral nerves. So there are uh, implants and devices that can help with bowel bladder uh, function, that can help with uh, ambulation. There are also some uh, external devices that can be worn to help with ambulation. So that is being uh, advanced also. Um, The, uh, there's um, some questions a lot about insurance and we've kind of talked about that a little bit. So uh, keep going, keep going with your insurance. If you know people get, oh, I asked my insurance and they denied me, so I can't have this. Appeal, appeal, appeal until they give a final denial, keep appealing. And when you get a final de denial, just rework your request in some other way or maybe with different equipment or different kinds of things, just keep working at it because it does happen. Um, keep uh, find, trying to find funding sources in that, in outside of uh, the usual insurance payment kind of things. People are having a lot of success. It is a lot of work. It's almost a full-time job, but uh, keep doing it. Go on places like the community and the Reed Foundation website and ask your, co ask your uh, fellow uh, community members, what's, what's happening with uh, payment? Did you, did you find any kind of uh, payment? How did you get this? Um, you know, what was done? Um, companies that uh, Make equipment will publish letters of medical necessity, which your physician has to send to the payer. Um, they can individualize it for you, but they have sample letters that have worked for getting that kind of equipment. So um, back to the shoulder. Um, somebody asked about a uh, frozen shoulder, and that is something that happens to people with or without spinal cord injury. Also winging, sometimes the shoulder blade uh, comes out with its alignment in the back and it kind of sticks out like a little wing. Um, both are very painful. If you don't have sensation, your body will be sending you other signals that there's this painful thing. Uh, the treatment for a frozen shoulder is uh, doing range of motion exercise aggressively by a therapist, you really need to go to a, a person who's educated in frozen shoulder to loosen up that. And you need to be cautious, be sure and say if you have um, AD, autonomic dysreflexia, because that therapy is painful. It can set off an episode. Um, same thing with uh, winging. Be sure you go uh, to a therapist that can help you manipulate these uh, joints back into shape and these um, the shoulders back into sh into shape. So how can you stop it? Um, sometimes people don't know what really caused it in the first place. 
So just be sure and do your gentle range of motion exercises, move your shoulders in all different ways. If you can't do it, have someone move it for you. A lot of times people do their exercises in bed, which is great because you can move up, you can move down, you can move forward, but you can't really move back unless you're in your wheelchair. And that doesn't mean, again, like I like with pushing your chair, if you gently move your shoulder back, don't force it back, don't push it too far, but very gently do that. And so that will help um, keep your shoulder joint flexible. Now, um, this is a question, how to stay positive in light of all that's going on? And I really like this question because this works um, no, no matter who you are. This is the question. We have been in this COVID for a long time and um, it's been a challenge for every single uh, person. Um, I know for myself, not being able to go out has been a challenge. Um, having other people get things for me is a challenge. Using uh, the delivery systems has been a wonderful opportunity. Well, it's a little more expensive, but using uh, the delivery systems of bringing things to my house has opened up the world to me. Um, staying positive is so very difficult. And yeah, we all have really down days. We're all sick of this COVID. Um, but, you know, we're, we're, there are treatments and uh, vaccines. Uh, very important to consider the vaccine. Some people are opposed to it and you know that you have to do what you need to do. But, you know, let's face it, the vaccine has been trialed on literally hundreds of millions of people in the United States and even more around the world. Uh, the side effects are very low, which I know is a hollow statement if you get a side effect. But yes, they might be, there might be some discomfort for a while, um, but people get over it. Uh, that yes, we hear these stories about um, people who got neurological injury uh, like Ian Barre, and that did happen in with one of the vaccines, but it was in the same number of people that can track Ian Barre in the general population. The difference is that one of the other drug trials did not have people with Guillain-Barre, which makes you wonder why that would be. And it, since it's the same as the number of people in the general population, um, that, that is, um, it's just a curiosity more than anything else, but still it's something that needs to be tracked down. So um, thinking about life in general, um, think about, you know, did anybody's life turn out to be how they thought it would? When I was a kid, all the girls wanted to be movie stars and all the boys wanted to be baseball players. And, you know, that when we were little, we were going to grow up and do that. And how many people really actually got those dreams. I mean, they're like um, occupations that are, you know, very limited, let's put it that way. So people find things that they like to do. You have to be constantly able to, well, this say this didn't work out, but maybe something else uh, will. So you just have to keep uh, going with it. And if you have trouble, be sure and contact somebody that you can talk to. We all have periods when things aren't going very well. And, um, you know, just be sure and uh, keep, keep trying and keep, keep working with it, talking to other people. Having a, a social group is like one of the biggest things, even if you just go to the grocery store, if you can go to the grocery store and you see a certain checker, just having that conversation is so helpful with, hi, how you doing? Nice to see you. Um, just interacting with people. Um, there's one more question in here about somebody who got the vaccine and their fingers curled and their uh, toes curled. And so, oh, here it is. Um, they got a third dose, not a booster, but a dose. And it, they didn't have any reaction before, but they had one to this. What could that all be about? And I thought, oh my goodness, what could it be about? Because it happened within that 15 minute window. So that's really not enough time to really get it um, all through your body. But you know, they have that 15 minute window of observation because they're looking to see if you have breathing problems. 
um, because you're allergic to something in there. So that, you know, there was a lot of talk about that in the beginning, but um, some people didn't know they were allergic to something in the vaccine. So check with your physician, make sure that you don't have that. Um, some people, I'm, some people got very excited and maybe had some difficulty breathing because of all the hype around it. I'm not discounting anybody's breathing, please. I mean that, you know, it's, it's real when it happens to you, it's all very nerve wracking. Um, so why did these fingers curl and the toes? Well, who knows? Um, hopefully that's resolved. I wonder, and I thought this about people who have uh, neurological problems, when you get that injection in an area maybe where your sensation is not quite right, it worried me in the beginning that people might have autonomic dysreflexia. And this could be, you know, maybe a, a triggered a spasm of some sort, you know, in the fingers and toes. Um, I thought people would have a lot more autonomic dysreflexia. Shockingly, they have not. So we can, you know, really kind of take that off the table. So um, with that, our hour is up. I see, I see I did not get to this question to Jennifer, but Jennifer is going to contact me. Um, you can contact me through uh, ChristopherReeve.org slash nurse. I am on uh, the computer uh, every Wednesday night uh, from seven to eight central time. So I will, but if, if you put a question into the Reed Foundation, it usually slips over to my email. And so I try to answer as soon as I get those questions. So feel free to answer all the, and ask a question at any time, but I am on live uh, from seven to eight, which means I will type an answer to you at that time. So thank you for joining us today. I hope I've answered your questions about the upper extremity. And um, I hope I haven't created any turmoil with the, um, with the uh, COVID vaccine. I'm uh, very much in favor of it. It's my personal opinion. Uh, please consider that. It's really something I think that will help people and will help us get over this, um, this uh, pandemic sooner rather than later. So thank you very much. And I'll see you next month. It was nice having you here today.